entanglement is a strange property of multiple qubits that allows them to carry more information than the individual qubits carry by themselves. For example, if we pass two qubits through this specific set of gates, then measure them afterwards, you find that we always measure them as both zero or both one. This ability for multiple measurements to be correlated is an essential property of entanglement. It tells us that the behavior of qubits together can't be explained by describing each qubit individually. To start, we'll represent a system of qubits using a collection of probabilities of how likely each combination of measurements is. We'll later look at what this explanation can't explain and use that to expand it appropriately. During this video, we'll be looking at both a more visual representation and a more rigorous representation. The latter uses tensors, specifically vectors. This lets us rigorously define a system of qubits as a vector of the probabilities of different measurements. To help keep track of this, we can label each element of the vector with the measurement it represents although this notation is not usually part of how vectors are written. To start, let's look more closely at this circuit that produces correlated measurements. The new gate on the block here is the controlled NOT gate. This gate swaps the probabilities of one qubit's measurement, but only where another control qubit will be measured as one. Notice how, before this gate, the system of qubits is equally likely to be measured as 0, 0, or 1, 0. We could describe this without entanglement by saying that the first qubit is equally likely to be measured as 0 or 1, while the second qubit will always be measured as 0. However, once the qubits pass through the controlled NOT gate, this kind of explanation stops working. If we go on to measure each qubit individually, you might be fooled into thinking that each simply has a 50-50 chance for each measurement. It's only when we look at both the measurements together that we notice an additional piece of information. Just like last time, it's convenient to say that in between the control dot and the measurement gates, the system of qubits remembers the different measurements it can produce. We'll later look at an experiment that proves this to be the case. Now that we have a description of this multi-qubit gate, what happens if we use one of our single qubit gates from last time? To start, we'll look at the NOT gate, which with our current model swaps the probabilities of a qubit being measured as 0 or 1. If we apply this to one of the qubits in our circuit, we find that the qubits go from always being measured as identical to always being measured as opposites. Notice how the NOT gate has effectively swapped the probabilities related to the qubit we used it on. More specifically, we can say that it swapped probabilities according to specific pairings. These are chosen so that there is one pairing for every possible combination of measurements on the other qubits. In other words, we can describe the effect of a logic gate on an entangled system by determining what happens to the qubit it operates on in every possible outcome. In this circuit, we're applying the NOT gate to the second qubit. This means it works on two pairs, one where the first qubit will be measured as 0, and one where it'll be measured as 1. This could be more easily appreciated in a larger system, so let's add a third qubit. Notice now that there are eight possible results from measuring the system. That means we need eight probabilities to account for entanglement. When we pass one of the qubits through a NOT gate, that acts to flip all pairs of probabilities associated with that qubit. Notice also that the NOT operation is effectively being performed four times in parallel. Every time we add another qubit, we double the number of operations performed by this gate. This should start to give a sense of how quantum computing can be faster than classical computing. Entanglement allows us to perform operations on large quantities of data by passing a single qubit through a single logic gate. This still has limitations though, since measurement only lets us see a random sampling of the data we produce, requiring clever tricks to ensure the measurement produces useful information. But that's a story for the next video.
for now, let's try using our new understanding to see what would happen if we use an Atomar gate on an entangled system. Immediately, we run into a problem. Our representation of qubits as collections of probabilities is insufficient to explain the function of the Atomar gate. Last time, we used the block sphere to represent singular qubits. This allows for many different states halfway between 0 and 1, a fact that the Atomar gate relies on to work properly. We need to find a way to expand our model to account for this extra information. Specifically, we need to find a representation which allows for many different halfway states, while still only allowing for a single always 0 state and a single always 1 state. To give us some extra data to work with, let's replace the real numbers we've been using with the complex numbers we looked at in a previous video. Notice that we were already using the amplitude of real numbers to denote how likely a particular measurement was. We can keep doing this when using complex numbers, which leaves the phase free to carry additional information. This replacement is immediately promising. There seems to be a nice parallel between the phase of these complex numbers and the angle around the z-axis on the block sphere. However, just using both of the phases to encode this property incorrectly allows many distinct states that will always be measured as zero. Instead of directly using the phases to encode the extra information, we can encode it as the difference between the two phases. When we have a state that is equally likely to be zero or one, this nicely allows for the flexibility shown in the block sphere. A state pointing on the positive x-axis is one where both phases match, while a state on the negative x-axis is one where the phases are opposite. When only one measurement is likely, the concept of a phase difference becomes meaningless, successfully encoding that there is only one state for each of these cases. Notice that there are still several different ways we can write down the state where zero is the only likely measurement. This is why it's important to emphasize that it's the difference between the phases that matters. More rigorously, we can say that if two vectors of complex numbers differ only by global phase rotation, then they represent physically indistinguishable states. For all practical purposes, these states should be considered the same. This fact is important to keep in mind whenever reading this representation. So there we go. We now have a representation of a qubit that correctly accounts for all aspects of the block sphere while still being scalable to work with entanglement. Although, there's actually one more detail to sort out. Since we're mathematically describing the states of qubits using vectors, it'd be very convenient if we could represent the effects of the Atomar gate as a matrix multiplication. This is typically written with the matrix on the left, but for now we'll reverse the convention so it lines up with our circuit. This would allow us to leverage the entire body of knowledge surrounding linear algebra when building quantum circuits. However, this isn't possible if we directly use the amplitudes of the complex numbers as probabilities. For example, let's try building a matrix which produces correct results for 0 and 1 qubits. Recall that matrix multiplication is a shortcut for multiplying the elements of a vector by each column of the matrix then adding the results to form a new vector. Let's start with inputting a qubit that will only be measured as zero. This amounts to singling out the first column of the matrix. Last time, we saw that the Atomar gate converts a zero qubit into this superposition. With our new representation, this means that the qubit needs to have a state where both measurements are equally likely and the phases match. We're now locked into using this for the first column of the matrix. Next, a qubit always measured as 1 gets converted into a superposition where the phases are exactly opposite. This again locks us into using it for the second column of the matrix. So far, everything looks good. Let's now try taking the superposition with matching phases and passing it back through the atom market. Last time, we saw that this should convert it back into a zero. However, we currently get a very strange result. A qubit that is 50% likely to be zero and 0% likely to be one, in clear violation of the basic rules of probability. To make this work, we utilize a clever trick called the Born Rule. 
what it says is that instead of each amplitude directly corresponding to a probability, we instead square it to get a probability. For example, an amplitude equal to the square root of 50% represents a measurement that is 50% likely. This simple trick is incredibly effective, and it clears our problem right up. A 50-50 qubit correctly gets converted back into its original state. A nice example of the mathematical power this work has gotten us is that multiplying this Atomar matrix by itself gives us an identity matrix that is one that causes no change when multiplied by a vector. This is an elegant proof that using the Atomar gate twice in a row produces no change. And now, we are actually ready to explain the role of the Atomar gate in a larger circuit. Using everything we've learned so far, we can explain it as several matrix multiplications on vectors grouped by the qubit the gate is working on. Let's look at some examples to build our intuition of what this means. In the case of the circuit at the start of the video, the H gate is simply working to create a state where the first qubit is equally likely to be 0 or 1. If we put an H gate on the second qubit as well, we'd get a state where all outcomes are equally likely. If we move the H gate after the controlled knot, we again get a state where all outcomes are equally likely. But since the controlled knot has moved a probability to the 1 state, we end up with this extra phase rotation. Remember that the H gate turns a qubit always measured as 1 to a qubit where both outcomes are equally likely, but the phases are opposite. This exact case is playing out in the grouping where the first qubit is 1. There's now something very interesting we can do with this circuit. If we add another H gate after the controlled knot, we find that the resulting state is the same as the one we had before. We've already seen how two H gates in a row produces no change, but in this case, we also find that two H gates side by side also produces no change. This fact is not generally true, but it is a very interesting consequence of this particular circuit. It's also an excellent test to see if entanglement really is necessary to explain the behavior of qubits. With the explanation we've built so far, we'd expect this circuit to always produce measurements that agree with each other. A simpler explanation for the behavior we saw earlier is that the controlled knot might just be randomly setting both qubits to be measured as 0 or both measured as 1, without creating any kind of entangled superposition. If that were the case, the two Atomar gates would take these qubits with definite states and rotate them into 50-50 superpositions, like we saw last time. In short, if entanglement isn't real, we'd expect our measurements after this circuit to be completely random. And yet, when we perform this experiment, we find that the measurements always match. This confirms that our more complicated explanation is correct. In this video, we've looked at how to represent states of multiple qubits as vectors of complex numbers. We've seen how the controlled knot gate has strange effects, giving rise to entanglement. We've also seen how to think about the function of single qubit gates in multi-qubit systems as matrix multiplications on smaller subvectors. In the next video, we'll explore Grover's algorithm, a technique for speeding up a large variety of computations by leveraging the effects we've been learning about.